Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Diego Lopez, a PhD student with the Feed Science Group at Kansas State University. So Diego, before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself and your background? Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me, Dr. Chastain. So I am originally from uh, Bogota, Colombia, which is like the capital city. And back in 2018, I believe, I came to the United States to uh, do an internship. From then, I ended up staying um, for my master's at the University of Illinois, where working with Dr. Hans Style. And now I'm working on my PhD, as you mentioned. Awesome. So speaking of your master's, you just finished that up recently. And I saw the uh, study that was published coming out of that about um, phytase and the different phosphorus digestibilities in certain ingredients. Would you mind telling us about that study? Absolutely. And allow me to give you some of the background of this study. Uh, back in 2015, I remember that one of the students was conducting an experiment trying to determine if there is any effect of phytase on the digestibility of calcium in different calcium supplements. At that point, they found out that the digestibility of calcium, calcium carbonate, was actually increased by the addition of phytase. And this may happen because when we include these supplements of calcium or phosphorus, in the case of my experiment, they can create some complexes with the phytate that is present in the plant feed ingredients, for example, corn. So if we can mm, utilize these phytates to break down those complexes that are being created in the uh, stomach or in the small intestine, there might be an effect on the digestibility of phosphorus uh, in for uh, pit phosphates. So to test that, we um, formulate three basal diets with zero, 500, and 4,000 uh, FTUs of phytase. And uh, to that, we add three different sources of um, pit phosphates. In this case, we use monocalcium phosphate, monosodium phosphate, and magnesium phosphate. And additionally, we have another diet to calculate the endogenous losses of phosphorus to be able to calculate uh, the standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus. Um, what we found is that there were no effects of phytase uh, on the digestibility of phosphorus. However, um, we saw the evidence that uh, 500 units of uh, phytase were not enough to completely release all the uh, phosphorus available in the, in the diets. And also there is a lower digestibility when magnesium phosphate is used uh, in comparison to monocalcium phosphate and monosodium phosphate. So with those those results that you saw with um, that 4,000 level, because you said the 500 might not be quite enough, uh, was that really, uh, did that release then a, a good amount of phosphorus, available phosphorus from the phytate in the plant sources as well as the phytate in the uh, feed phosphates? So what we could, um, what the that data suggests is that all the dig uh, all the extra phosphorus was um, released from the feed the plant ingredients. There was no effect whatsoever on the feed phosphates, and uh, part of that uh, could be due to the fact that we use diets that didn't have a high value of uh, phytate. So that could be a, a step forward uh, to maybe include something like uh, can, uh, canola meal to increase the uh, substrate for the phytase uh, to work on. Uh, but there, there were no effects uh, in the digestibility of the feed phosphates, just in the digestibility of the feed ingredients uh, that are plant-based. Gotcha. So what do you think really was the the cause of that with no really phytase being no extra sorry no extra phosphorus being released from the phytate in those feed phosphates do you think it was just a matter of um abundancy where there was a lot more phytate from the uh plant sources or do you think there was something else involved so what we can op I hypothesize is that some of the um phosphate groups that are disattached from the monocalcium phosphate and monosodium phosphate or magnesium phosphate um, are not able to create a new bond with the phytate that is already into the feed. We need to um, remember that inositol phosphate, which is the molecule that actually contains the phosphorus in the plants, 
is always uh, a ring with six different um, spots for phosphates. And um, not always is going to be present in the field ingredients like that. Sometimes we have five, sometimes we have four. And those are um, the specific molecules that the phosphate could attach to and create new bonds. So uh, we theorize that maybe is not so likely to create those new bonds and to, uh, during the digestion. So you think it's more like a, a difference in like chemical structure between the, the plant sources and the feed phosphate? Am I understanding that right? Yeah, it, it could be, or it could be as as we mentioned before, uh, a lack of um, substrate for the phytase. Gotcha. So then with these feed phosphates, um, I mean, obviously there's some nutritional benefit that we're still getting from it, like monocalcium phosphate, you're still getting a good amount of calcium. And uh, based on the already kind of calculated uh, f free uh, phosphorus that's already in there, do you think there's as much nutritional benefit that we're receiving those as we think that we are with the um, when you add phytase to the diet? I think that as we move to like more um, efficient phytases, um, we're going to see a decrease in the use of uh, feed phosphates because it's uh, way cheaper to include the phytase on it. Um, we're still going to have to uh, supplement one of calcium phosphate or dicalcium phosphate in the rare cases that we need a higher amount of phosphorus that we need for sure. Um, but if we can obtain everything from the plant feed ingredients, we should try to go for that. Gotcha. And I know that you left Illinois University and you're now getting your PhD at Kansas State. Uh, but do you know if, what the next steps for their team would be? Obviously, you wouldn't be leading that study. Um, but do they plan to do any more research in this field at all? Uh, we have discussions about maybe using a different type of diet. Uh, as I mentioned before, maybe using canola meal uh, to increase the content of um, phytate in the in the diet. Um there is also a, is a very interesting effect that we observe um, and is that in monocalcium phosphate and monosodium phosphate, we observe really high digestibility of phosphorus, but for magnesium phosphate, it's completely different. It's uh, way lower. So it will be interesting to see if there is any type of like antagonistic relationship between magnesium and phosphorus or if any type of uh, digestibility will be decreased by overshooting our magnesium. Uh, so maybe taking a look at that, it would be interesting, but the problem with that is that not a lot of people actually uses magnesium phosphate in our industry. Gotcha, gotcha. Combining basic science with real world facilities results in swine nutrition programs that deliver impactful bottom line performance. Hubbard Feeds is focused on helping you achieve your goals and make your life easier along the way. Choose a company that can match your appetite for innovation by visiting hubbardfeeds.com forward slash swine research. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Diego. It's been a pleasure to have you on here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey everyone, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Oh.